Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend, Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. Today, I wanted to talk to you about a topic that is of really deep interest to me, and that is the sinking of the RMS Lusitania in the First World War in 1915. Now, in May of that year, she was very famously and tragically torpedoed by the German submarine U-20. Now, the interesting thing about the Lusitania to me, as with all disasters, is that often there's usually not one thing that goes wrong leading up to this situation. There's often a number of things that have had to have failed for this to happen. It's not unlike Air Crash Investigation. For those of you who've watched that show, I can't really think of any one plane that was brought down by one failure. There's usually a number of things that have to go wrong in the first place. And so it is the case with the Lusitania. I can think of actually five distinct areas where if one of these things hadn't have happened, then the Lusitania may not have been put in harm's way and sunk when she did. So today, let's count down and figure out the five things that could have changed to have prevented the sinking of the Lusitania in 1915. Number one, mid-war sailings. When the Lusitania and her sister ship, the Mauritania, were first introduced in 1906 and 1907, they were the very, very latest thing in shipbuilding. They were the largest and fastest ocean liners in the world. But part of their construction costs had actually been covered and subsidized by the British government. And this was because of an agreement in place between Cunard Line, the ship's owners, and the British government that at the outbreak of war, in the event of any future war, Lusitania and Mauritania would be deployed as armed auxiliary cruisers. Now an auxiliary cruiser is a ship which has been designed not necessarily as a warship, but that can be converted a little bit and set to sea on military operations. Typically hunting down, say, enemy merchant ships like cargo ships and the like. On the early plans for Lusitania and Mauritania, you can clearly see mountings that were intended for the installation of six inch guns in the outbreak of a war. This thought process was largely because years earlier during the Boer War, ships had proved incredibly useful uh, in transporting troops en masse and a number of White Star Line and Cunard commanders had actually served as captains during those voyages. But just before the First World War, it was thought that giant ocean liners, because they are so fast and because they're so large, would be really adept at covering great distances quickly and hunting down enemy merchant ships. But when World War I actually broke out, the concept absolutely fell apart because Lusitania and Mauritania, along with the likes of Olympic and Britannic and Aquitania, chewed up enormous amounts of coal, massive amounts of fuel. In fact, to actually keep these ships serviceable and operating as armed cruisers would have almost exhausted the entire reserve supply of Royal Navy coal by three months into the war. So they couldn't do it. Therefore, the entire liner fleet was mothballed while they decided what to do with them. And in the case of Mauritania and Olympic and Aquitania, they were put to sea as troop ships. Britannic was still under construction during the outbreak of the First World War, but she was finished off as a hospital ship. And crucially, the Lusitania was actually put to sea as an ocean liner. You see, there was enough business to warrant Cunard operating one transatlantic liner from their home port of Liverpool all the way across to New York and back still. There were passengers who wanted to seek refuge from the war, so they might have been refugees fleeing west and therefore booking passage on the Lusitania to get to the New World and get to America. But there are also people going back the other way. So you had missionaries, you had aid workers, you had people wanting to be reunited with their families if they had originally been from Europe and that kind of thing. So Cunard Line reached an agreement with the British Admiralty that kept Lusitania in service at incredibly as a passenger ship in the middle of a war zone. And of course, the number one threat to a passenger ship such as the Lusitania is going to be German submarines. Now, U-boats aren't very fast. A German submarine could really only manage about nine knots underwater and at best 15 knots surfaced. But Lusitania's absolute secret weapon was her speed. She was capable of 25 knots, which in peacetime is really useful because you can get across the Atlantic and get passengers home safe and sound in record time. It's doubly useful during wartime because suddenly German submarines, in theory, can't catch you. So, so long as Lusitania can keep her top speed going, she should be okay. So it's this arrogant kind of thinking that the Lusitania would be fast enough to outrun any danger at all times that actually put her into harm's way in the first place. 
Number two, the Lusitania's secret cargo. Now, I mentioned earlier that Lusitania had originally been built as a potential auxiliary cruiser. Now, this isn't really that good of a thing when you're a passenger ship because suddenly on all the official registries, you are listed as an auxiliary cruiser and as it was the case for Lusitania. It's probably doubly as bad if you're just trying to maintain the guise of your passenger ship being just that, a passenger ship, to load it up with, say, ammunition for the war zone that it's heading toward. That would be against the rules. But Cunard and the British government did it anyway. Thanks to relatively lax New York Harbour customs procedures, the British Admiralty and government was able to establish a deal with the likes of the Remington Small Arms Company based in the US to manufacture huge amounts of ammunition, uh, like rifle rounds and shells, and transport them back to Britain, even though the US was still neutral. And to obfuscate that and make it not that obvious, they employed the Lusitania to carry tons and tons and tons of this ammunition back across the Atlantic. Now, you may have heard this figure floated around that Lusitania was carrying, among other things, 4 million rifle rounds. Now to put that into perspective, the standard British service rifle of the First World War was the number one Mark III short magazine Lee Enfield rifle. Now the short magazine Lee Enfield rifle had a 10 round clip. So you would load in a clip and it would have 10 bullets. Now the British soldier's combat load of ammunition was carried in his 1908 Patton Webbing, which had two ammunition pouches of 75 rounds each. So that's around about 150 303 rifle rounds per man. So Lusitania on that single voyage was carrying enough 303 rifle rounds to completely resupply the combat load for 28,000 men, which is actually two divisions worth of men. And if Lusitania was making this crossing every couple of weeks, she could resupply two whole divisions of soldiers on the front line every couple of weeks. That's the kind of resupply that can make an actual dent in the war effort towards the favour of the Allies. So Lusitania's efforts were no small thing. That's a lot of ammunition. And on top of that, she was carrying thousands of shell casings and fuses and even some explosive. Now, I'm not suggesting necessarily that this directly contributed to the sinking of the Lusitania. The Germans, in fact, may not have definitely known that she was carrying this kind of contraband munition. But there were German spies among the New York dock workers, for sure. There were German spies operating all throughout the US. And it seems ridiculous to me to think that they couldn't have got an inkling about what was going on, therefore painting a huge target on the Lusitania. So two things stacking up here, that the British government ignore the threat of the U-boat fleet and decide with Cunard to keep the Lusitania in operation as a passenger ship, and they load the ship with tons of ammunition thus painting a target on the ship's back. It should be fine, so long as she can keep up her speed, right? Number three, speed versus profit. Now this is a small point, but a very important point, because I mentioned earlier that Cunard had enough business, there was enough traffic going from across the Atlantic both ways to warrant keeping Lusitania in service. The voyages were booked nowhere near as full as her normal peacetime sailings. Of course, most people probably weren't brave enough to want to sail across the Atlantic in the middle of a war zone. Totally fair enough. But it meant that profits were being eaten into. And so the decision was made to shut down some of Lusitania's boilers. And she was only operating at about three quarters of her usual power. Which meant that her top speed, her secret weapon, dropped from 25 knots to 21 knots. Now this isn't necessarily a problem, 21 knots is still pretty quick for the time. You think that the RMS Olympics top speed was about 22 knots at full clip. Um, she could outrun danger, she was pretty safe. But it seems really unusual to me to have your ship in harm's way and then take away its most valuable asset, which is its great speed. In fact, at 25 knots, there is very little in the German fleet that could have caught her. The only thing I can think of are the German battle cruisers, like the Der Flinger, whose top speed was 26 and a half knots, but their role wasn't to chase down British passenger ships. So she would have been pretty safe if she had kept to 25 knots across the Atlantic. But okay, that's fine, 21 knots. That should be fine, so long as she does the 21 knots and doesn't go any slower, right? Well, number four, Captain Turner's many mistakes. It's very easy for me as a civilian enthusiast to sit back here over a hundred years after the sinking of the Lusitania and criticize and fault her captain. 
and I don't really want to do that too much, but the man made a number of critical errors that put Lusitania increasingly deeper into dangerous territory. So let's run through these real quick. A couple of quick points about the man. His name was Bill Turner, not to be confused with the Pirates of the Caribbean, Bill Turner. His nickname was Bowler Bill for his habit of buying a new bowler hat every time he took command of a new ship. He was a veteran captain. He had started in sail, as many of them had, during the great era of the clipper ships, the sailing ships of the late 19th century, before joining the Cunard Line and working his way up to CO. And he had served on quite a few famous passenger ships, including the Umbria, the Carpathia, and the Lusitania. He had commanded Lusitania during peacetime. He knew the ship well, and he knew the route well. He knew the transatlantic trade like it was the back of his hand. The man was a veteran. He'd also been the chief officer on the Umbria during the Boer War. So in his mind, he's experienced shipping during wartime. But that was a very different war because at the time there was no enemy submarine activity. So, you know, this is a bit of a new and dangerous world for Turner to kind of get his head around. But so long as he follows Admiralty instruction, he should be fine. So his orders are this, to maintain full speed at all times, 21 knots, to avoid headlands and to sail mid-channel. So that is to stay away from the coast and stay far out at sea and to avoid harbors where submarines would typically sit around and wait for ships to torpedo. Now Turner ignored all of these directives. On the day of the sinking, he was sailing just 15 miles off the coast of Ireland. Now the final warning that was sent to Lusitania detailed the fact that there was increased enemy submarine activity off the south coast of Ireland. So Turner should have known that he had to sail at full speed through that area to get out of harm's way. But a fog bank rolled in and he slowed Lusitania way down from 21 knots to 18 and then finally 15 knots. For four hours, Lusitania was crawling along at 15 knots, blasting her foghorn in the middle of a war zone. And the passengers noticed and they were a little bit rattled and surprised that they were broadcasting their position and blowing their foghorn while crawling along at really low speed. But when the fog lifted, Turner powered the engines back up but not to full power. He only got the ship moving at 18 knots instead of her lowered top speed of 21 knots. So he wasn't using the ship's great speed to stay out of danger. For some reason, he kept her moving along fairly slowly. So he's been ordered to go full speed through this area like there's no tomorrow, and he's slowed his ship down. He's also been ordered to zigzag. If you keep your ship moving in an unpredictable way, it's going to be really hard to get a bearing on that ship if you're a submarine captain. But Turner misunderstood his orders, he claimed. He said that he thought he only had to zigzag if he spotted a submarine. So Lusitania was sailing straight ahead, wasn't taking any kind of evasive maneuver whatsoever in waters that were known to be crawling with German submarines. Now the final blunder that Turner made was to conduct a routine four point bearing off the old head of Kinsale Lighthouse on the south coast of Ireland. And that meant keeping the Lusitania sailing straight ahead for about 40 minutes while he conducted this navigational check. It seems unbelievable to me that Turner found the need to conduct a navigational check in a stretch of water that he had traversed as captain of the Lusitania dozens of times. Now he might have been thinking it would be highly, highly unlikely for him and his ship to get so unlucky as to stumble across a German submarine at that exact critical moment while she was conducting the bearing check. She should be fine. Wrong. Number five, coincidence. Unbeknownst to Turner, the Lusitania had been shadowed by the U-20 for quite some time. Now Schweigo had the ship in his sights. At first he actually thought it was multiple ships because of the numbers of funnels and masts until finally it emerged that it was actually a four stacker. He could count the four funnels and he knew straight away that it could only be one of five British ships. The Mauritania, the Aquitania, the Olympic, the Britannic, or the Lusitania. Now he never admitted to knowing exactly what ship it was, but Lusitania and Mauritania were celebrities at that time. They were some of the most famous and well-known ships in the world. Not only that, but Lusitania's sailing schedule was advertised in American newspapers. It would have been obvious that this was in fact the Lusitania, even though Schweiger, of course, never admitted that he knew because then he would be admitting to firing upon civilians willingly. 
Lusitania was originally sailing away from Schweiger in the U-20, and he figured that he actually wouldn't be able to get a shot off. But then Turner started the bearing check and brought Lusitania perfectly into U-20 sights at 700 meters, which is absolutely point blank range for a submarine commander, Schweiger fired a single torpedo. It's incredibly coincidental that at the time that Turner intended to conduct the navigational check, the U-20 was perfectly poised to fire a shot off. And some have even postulated that the attack on the Lusitania by U-20 was premeditated, that the German Navy was out specifically to hunt down and destroy the Lusitania and a blow to British morale. Now, the impact of the Lusitania sinking has sometimes been a little overstated as being the thing that drew America into the First World War because so many Americans died in the sinking. This isn't entirely true. America would only join the effort against Germany two years later in 1917. But the sinking of the Lusitania helped push public American opinion away from supporting the Germans and more towards the British. And it also helped the British Admiralty push this idea of the barbarism and aggression of the German Navy in targeting and sinking a passenger ship. Just like any disaster, there's not any one thing that can be to blame for the sinking of the Lusitania. We could blame Captain Turner's blunders for the sinking, but then what was she even doing there in the first place? Why did Cunard feel the need to continue to run this lone ship in order to generate some meager profit from whatever small trade there was in passengers looking to get across the Atlantic. Would the Lusitania have made it if her top speed was more than 21 knots? If Turner felt that he could bring the ship back up to 25 knots, it seems feasible that the U-20 would not have been able to catch and sink her. If the U-20 didn't happen to be there, if it was just a couple of miles away or if it had been held up by slightly poorer weather the day before, she wouldn't have been in that perfect firing solution to sink the ship. But she was, and those five key things that Cunard continued to operate the Lusitania as a passenger ship through the First World War, that they enabled her to carry some pretty spicy cargo in the form of millions of rifle rounds and ammunition, thus painting a legitimate target on the ship's back, that she continued to operate with three quarters of her boilers only and a reduced top speed, that her CO, Will Turner, made a number of basic errors and ignored Admiralty instruction to the end, and that the U-20 just happened to be in the perfect position to land a killing blow on the ship. Those five things ultimately led to the ship's sinking. And it's curious to wonder if any one of them hadn't have happened, then the Lusitania might have had a career as long and as successful as her sister ship, the Mauritania. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Oceanliner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please think about liking and subscribing to the channel. Every little bit helps, and I aim to make a video like this once every week, so you'd hate to miss out. Or you could support my channel on Patreon. You'll find the link down in the description. Until then, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.